Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to View from Love. I am your host, Allie Ray, and I am thrilled to have you on this podcast journey of extraordinary love. Today's inspiring guest is Daniel B. Holman. Daniel is an incredible artist, well known for his sacred imagery, as well as for being an ambassador of the Gene Keys. He's an artist, a teacher, and a mentor, and I'm delighted to have him join us to share more about his artistic journey, as well as his insights from the Gene Keys. So Daniel B. Holman, welcome to View From Love. What an honor to have you here today. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you. <laughs> um, Daniel, for those who may be meeting you for the first time, could you give us a little bit of insight as to how your journey with doing the sacred imagery started? Well, I started, uh, I, I'd never had an idea of being an artist in my life when I was young. I, I did go, uh, do well in art class back in the late 60s in high school. And uh, I would do things and uh, sometimes uh, at home start doing projects like that they taught about on my own just because I enjoyed it. And then I'd get positive feedback. So I had kind of a sense of like, hey, I can kind of do this. Uh, this is something I enjoy and I'm kind of good at it. But then I was also, I was even more interested in spiritual um, questing or understanding life because I grew up in a rather dysfunctional family like a lot of people in those days and even nowadays. And um, I wanted to find some answers. And I'd also been exposed to uh, uh, LSD back then and had some openings of uh, awareness. And I, th I thought, wow, I want to understand life because there's more than just this superficial reality that we're kind of presented with on television and stuff. And so I started to read books, uh, Alan Watts and all these types of uh, spiritual people. And I thought, well, um, that's what I want to do. And I did. I, sp I spent 20 years you know, pursuing spiritual qu uh, pursuits to understand things and so forth. And it wasn't until um, much later in my life when I was 37, I believe, that I was coming across these books uh, and, and, and information like, um, let's see, it was Joseph Campbell was saying, follow your bliss. And there was the book out called, uh, do what you love and the money will follow. And these types of things. And I was thinking, well, gee, what do I love? And, uh, because I was training people on computer programs and it just didn't fit <laughs> what I was doing. I did various uh -huh. things, you know, for work. And uh, so, and then I was actually selling real estate for a while, which also didn't fit me at all. But I was doing it to say, well, I can make money with real estate and then I can like do my spiritual, earn enough money to kind of open up a spiritual center and stuff like that. Because I didn't know how to make money with spiritual stuff. So then um, I, I thought, well, what do I enjoy? Well, I, I, I enjoyed doing art when I was young and I like music. So I went and I got a volunteer job at a local community radio station to share music. And I went out down, down to the paint store. Actually, I said a prayer. I said a prayer just to the universe saying, show me how to be an artist because I have no clue. <laughs> and then a week later, I got a call from the company I worked for saying, we're going out of business. So here's a small, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Severance. Termination yeah. package. There's yeah. nothing really, a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. And um, so I, I first I was like shocked, what am I going to do? And then I thought, well, this must be an answer to my prayer, you know, that I wanted to show to be an artist. So I went down to the store, the art store, and I said, sell me everything I need to be an artist, you know, like the palette and the paints and the canvas and the turpentine and everything. So I got all this stuff and I started painting and just more or less was self-taught. I did get feedback from a friend who was an artist that gave me a few pointers, but I, that's how I started, was just uh, kind of figuring out as I, as I went. And what were the first things that you painted? Just dolphins. All I did was oh. painted abstract dolphins because I didn't really know how to paint. So I do kind of a silhouette of a dolphin with colors because I was really into the, the color thing and I still am. A lot of the stuff I do is all about the colors and how that makes uh, me feel. When I look at the colors, I go, 
oh, that combination really feels good. I love that, you know? And so I did dolphins and people used to call me the dolphin artist. And I just did dolphins on canvas. And uh, then it kind of evolved from there. I, 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 I was actually in a gallery looking in Hawaii, looking at an artist that I really liked. And I asked the person, how do they do that effect? They said, well, they paint an oil painting and then they touch it up with airbrush to give it a kind of a etheric look. Mm -hmm. So I went out and I got an airbrush and the compressor and everything else. And I started doing that. And so I kind of developed a kind of a style that's kind of a, I don't know if you call it spiritual, but kind of mystical. Yeah, um, yeah. Kind yeah. of etheric. And um, it gradually evolved from there. And over time, um, I lost my home that I had. And so I had no studio to paint in. And a friend of mine at the same time gave me a computer. And I and, and it was someone else told me, another friend told me about Photoshop. So I scanned in my, I got a computer, he gave me a computer, I bought a scanner and I bought Photoshop. And uh, I scanned in my photos of my art and would play around with them in Photoshop and kind of add effects and do things. And then that just sort of evolved over time as a technique, which yeah. a lot of artists actually started doing over time is manipulating original stuff to make it uh, do things that you can't do on the canvas and uh, achieve different effects and things like that. Yeah, and like, when did you start doing that? Was that, that was the early stages of Photoshop, I'd imagine, like you were, you were painting and then... Um... That was in the late 90s. It was yeah. in the uh, early, uh, it was in the late 80s. 1989 was when I started painting on canvas with oils. And then it was about 10 years later, maybe a little bit less than that, maybe seven years later, eight, eight years later, that I got the computer and started doing more computer type. It's not computer generated, it's computer enhanced. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. So you, you kind of pretty much did the self-teaching technique again with the software that you had done with the canvas and the airbrush. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that much about it, some of the technical capabilities of Photoshop, but I learned to use it as a, as a kind of a painter's tool. So I, I use it as another, like a type of a, a technique as a tool. And was that around the time that you segued out of the dolphins? Uh, I segued out of the dolphins earlier when I was still oh. painting. And I started doing various things of space and certain types of uh, clouds and landscapes, but all of it was kind of, I guess at the time you'd call it kind of new agey. Mm -hmm. Now that's a derogatory mm -hmm. term a lot of times, but it was that type of style. They, I guess they call it visionary art. And I remember going, uh, before I even started, I remember going one time to a, um, a showing of, of with a bunch of different artists this was in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it was called Visionary Art, and it was something that was kind of new back then. This is in the 80s, in the late 80s, and I, um, I liked it. I thought, wow, look at all these paintings of space and dolphins and, and, and under, underwater nature and other things, but it's all kind of magical and kind of a little bit fantasy and stuff like that, and I thought, oh, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. So that's but, the direction I went. Was that actually kind of corresponding with your own inner journey, like your spiritual journey? You said that you were following kind of a, an inner inner journey, an inner quest. Um, so who were some of your inspirations at that time? You were doing meditations and were you going to retreats or doing any sort of, um, you know, group um, exploration too at that time? Well, here's the story on that. I, I, at first, I'd explored a lot of Eastern traditions and Alan Watts and other, other authors and stuff when I was young in the 60s. And then I ended up getting into a cult, which I, I'm not really proud of, but I'm not regretting either because I learned a lot life experience from that experience. And I was in it for like 12 years. And I went way in deep in it. It was Scientology. 
And I lived on this ship with L. Ron Hubbard and his family and all the people that ran Scientology internationally. And my sister was there and it was a 325 foot yacht and there were like 400 people on it. And it was kind of adventurous because I did it when I was 18 wow. through the, till, till I was 30. And, but after I left that, and I, it became kind of stagnated. And- uh, um, So would you mind if I ask it, you, Daniel, were you traveling the world? on the yacht or were you kind of stationed? It I mean, this is fascinating to me. I haven't heard anyone talk about this. It stayed mainly around the uh, Portugal and Morocco was the main kind of area would kind of travel around. But yeah, it, it traveled around. It was kind of adventurous for a young man in his late, late teens. I uh, he learned all the different um, uh, skills to, to, you know, navigate a ship and to live on a ship and so forth. You know, I did, they trained you on how to do different things. Like I was a lookout and then I was a quartermaster and various things like that, you know, that you have duties and things. But um, after a while it started to get, I don't know if you want to say dark, it kind of turned a little bit over time mm -hmm. from being this fun, exciting thing to being a little bit more militaristic and things you hear about today when people talk about Scientology, it started to get in that direction. And uh, so I eventually left and so did my sister. And then my whole life opened up and I was reading all kinds of things. It was like being in a candy store with, with metaphysics and spirituality because there was all these other options which weren't available when I was in a cult because that's all you're kind of focused on and allowed, you know? Right. And so I was studying astrology and reading all these different books and all these things. So yes, my life was opening up and I also felt a liberation um, being free. Like I, I had been so under this uh, kind of um, authoritative rule of what they say to do and now I was just my own agent. I was just a free agent in the world. And I had to learn how to make money and I had to learn how to operate in the society and stuff like that. But it was um, an interesting time period. And that after uh, just a few years of that, uh, kind of a, a blossoming, that's when I started doing artwork. And so, because I, I started to, wow. like I say, uh, Joseph Campbell and those books that were talking about how important it is to be doing what your passion is as opposed to what you think you're supposed to do to make money or what your parents tell you to do or just other reasons that are not valid you know yeah you know daniel i i'm just so struck by this by your experience of having been on a ship and been isolated in that way and then the feeling that you had in having the freedom right of stepping into basically a new world and having to um, allow your spirit, your inner being to guide you and to you know, lead you on this exploration of what life was gonna be like. And what is striking me in this moment is that you had like a microcosmic experience of what I feel humanity is going through right now. There are so many who have been in what we would call just the collective normal world Yet many of us within are feeling this birth of something new, of something rising within us and a new call to freedom, which you so brilliantly just described that feeling when you got off that ship. And I just think it's so interesting and, and, and truly fascinating that you got to have an experience like that. It was almost kind of like um, preparation you know, and the vibration and the of all of that experience like imprinted your being <laughs> so that right now, you know, this is all, for me, it's bringing into play you being an ambassador of the gene keys, you know, this kind of full circle understanding of this evolution of every soul and kind of what we're doing collectively, um, humanity evolving. I just I'm totally blown away right now. Just I had no idea. <laughs> Um, about no, that, I, that story. And so I think people are going to really, wow, that I think there's a few mouths dropping open right now because it's it's really incredible that that you had that experience. 
Well, it, I, I think of it now, looking back in hindsight, as a stage that a lot of uh, young people in their late teens, after they're you know, kind of breaking away from their parents, being their authorities, and they kind of go through a stepping stone, a lot of them enter the military or get jobs where they're being told what to do, and they have kind of pseudo parents or replacements for their parents by some authority that's telling them what to do and how to be and all these things. And then they kind of hopefully learn and grow out of that to become their own authorities and trust their inner guidance and um, find their uh, inner authority, so to speak. And uh, some people don't. Some people go through those stages and then just become bitter. Like my sister uh, became kind of bitter about her experience in that cult. And I was, you know, kind of complaining about it. I look back at it and I go, well, yeah, it had its drawbacks, particularly toward the end. But I learned a lot from like the experience, life experience, not no, not learning from what they were teaching me, learning from the experience of, of re giving away my power to an external authority like that, as opposed to uh, relying on my own judgment and my own um, uh, path, you know, finding yeah. my own way, you know. Yeah, so I, I love this, Daniel, because thing. because you're actually in saying that, you're actually pointing to the love, the love that's always there, even in experiences that we have that that aspects of our mind could definitely point and judge, but yeah. when we actually tune in at the level that you're speaking of here, we can actually see the love. I mean, for you to acknowledge what you learned with that is you actually acknowledging the love of you, right? And of being and of appreciating the opportunity to be alive and to have all of these experiences. Yeah, well, I, I kind of look at it as like I was growing up. <laughs> it's yeah. a, a, a process of growing up as a being not growing up as a body, but growing up as a spiritual being and kind of maturing and, and kind of getting uh, weaned off of those types of, um, it's not that they're bad, they're just less mature, just like a child. There's nothing wrong with a child being a little child and being immature. It's just a stage to go through to get to other places and they're, they're all valid stages to go through. And hopefully people uh, grow up and mature as they have yeah. experiences through, through those yeah. types of things. Sometimes they're unpleasant, but you learn from them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, um, going back to, to the spiritual kind of the art that you're more known for now, when did that start to come about? Because I know through the spiritual communities, um, I've seen your art used by a lot of beautiful souls um, sharing your artwork with their uh, communications, their meditations and, and things like that. And um, you seem to be incredibly able to tune in to the energies at, at the higher frequencies that um, so many are experiencing, divine feminine, divine masculine, different aspects of the heart. Um, how did that all get activated within you? Do you? Was there a first time or did this just seem to be something that um, evolved over time? It evolved over time gradually. And I kind of think of it, looking back, as, as I evolved myself, so did my style and my ability to capture different qualities. And um, I, I get kind of, uh, what do you call it? Lo losing kind of interest and attraction to some of the stuff that I did early on. At the time, I thought it was good. You know, I thought, oh, this is really cool. I like this, what I did. Because a lot of my process is not so much having a fixed idea in my mind and then depicting it on a canvas or on the computer or whatever, but it's having a, a vague idea and playing with it, doing stuff and 
and looking at it and going a kind of a discovery as I go, which is what kind of my mm. life has been like too. And as I go and I go, well, oh, I bet if I put some stars up here, that would be good. Or, you know, what does this need? And sometimes I'd set it aside and come back to it even days or longer later and then have an idea that like, oh, that's what this needs. Or I'd work on another painting and do something else and then that would give me an idea to come back to this one and go, oh, if I put this kind of an effect on here, that would make that one complete, you know? So it was kind of a, a process of discovery and unfolding as I went, more kind of intuitive than premeditated. And I, I, that's just been kind of how I am in life and how I create. It, that's what works for me. So, so Daniel, was there a point when being an artist, like actually doing the artwork itself became what you do? That became you doing your passion or have you been um, doing other things to support your art? I did do other things for different? a while. Yes, to make money. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a point where I was, I was still doing creative stuff. This is actually after I started being on computer shortly after I was starting to be on computer. And uh, I was working with a, it wasn't a, a part-time job. It was a temporary job for like about four months or five months where they needed someone at this newspaper. Uh, and I was doing kind of layout and working with, I don't know, it was like kind of grunt work in a way. It was not real creative, but I would, you know, kind of lay out the ads and I would do other things with the scanning. Uh, it was actually for USA Today with their local branch in Marin County. And I was doing that work and I was uh, putting in a lot of hours and I was go home and I worked a little bit on the creative stuff. And I thought, you know, if I put in as much hours on art as I was putting in for these other people doing this grunt work, I would be successful and I could make enough money to survive, you know, to live on. And so when that job ended, uh, that's what I just, that's what I did. I put in a lot of time and I started doing it more and more. And I still had trouble financially. I kind of struggled for a number of years because I found in hindsight, there's so much psychology that comes into play for me particularly, but with a lot of artists, where I had low self-esteem, I had still struggled psychologically and so forth. Um, how, do I, how do I make money doing this thing? You know, how do I survive? And it's like, you have to put, put your offering out there to people. Well, I did this, do you like it? You know, do you wanna buy it? You know, and hope that, that they're gonna like it and that they're gonna pay for it, you know? And um, and they did, but it was it was kind of minimal, or it was it was gradual. And so I over time, that um, as I became more confident and had more experience and got more feedback, because that was something that in the early days was important to me was to get that external validation. Mm -hmm. I felt very insecure psychologically. Like, I, know, I don't feel like I'm a valid person. Now, it sounds silly to say that, but I was young, you know, and I, I never resolved that as I was growing up until finally doing, doing years of the artwork. And getting Daniel, I feel like this is so beautiful that you're bringing this forward because I feel like so many people can resonate with that. And it doesn't matter their age at all. Yeah that that is an experience of being human, yeah. you know, that we are all just hardwired in as we come into our bodies, we're looking at, you know, our mom and dad or whoever our, our parental figures are early on, we're looking to be seen, we're looking to be acknowledged. And so much of the human journey feels like we're very isolated and alone within. So we're looking for the external to say, yes, it's good. Yes, it's good enough. Yes, you're worthy. Yeah. You know, all of those things. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I so appreciate you saying this because it's not even about age or immaturity or anything. It truly just is an experience, a human experience that that um, 
to be courageous enough to go through the journey, as you're saying, right? The art ended up being an incredible gift. It was also a healer <laughs> for you, for oh. the aspects of you that were looking for it. It's like in the being of it all, you became the validation which is truly beautiful. And that's something that a lot of people, um, it takes a while for us to really embrace and appreciate that everything that we are being is contributing to that, to our own yeah. love and validation and the return to our own wholeness, you know? And on such a human level, we would say confidence or self-esteem, but on another level, it's so much more than that. You know, it's returning to our wholeness and in our wholeness, yeah. nothing's lacking, right? So we wouldn't move forward asking for somebody to please, please like it or accept it. Instead, it's, this is me, you know, this I am yeah. essentially, right? This I am and this I share with love with no expectations. Because that's the Very thing true. too that yeah. I that I feel, and it's interesting because uh, my experience, as I shared with you, about working with artists and being in the art community, um, is that art resonates vibrationally. It's a feeling. It's a universal language. And one of the things that inspired me so much with your art was that I could feel that resonance. You know, it's a mm -hmm. resonance of wholeness and a resonance of a reflection of a lightness, you know, and that essence, that lightness, I feel like it's in every piece of art that I have looked at from you, regardless of what, you know, if some of your images, you know, are incorporating darker colors and richness and jewel tones. And then you also have, you know, the pastels and the lighter things. Um, but there's this essence of light and spark, right, that I say, that I feel, and I feel it in your artwork, and I know that to be a reflection of that universal spark. It's like that soul spark, and that's why I feel like your artwork is so profound, because whether a person is consciously aware of it or not, it's there, you know? it's there. And for some people, it's felt very deeply, you know, some people have even shared with me that looking at some of your images, like in your uh, latest calendar, which by the way, um, you are going to want to check out the comments um, from this podcast, I'm going to send you links to Daniel's work. Um, he has a current calendar for 2022 out with incredible artwork that many have reached out to me saying, it feels like they're having activations, heart activations. Um, from the artwork in your calendar. So I'm encouraging everyone to please take a look at the comments after listening to this podcast uh, so that you can experience it and learn more about Daniel's artwork. But yeah, Daniel, well, I feel you. like it's so yes. incredibly beautiful that your own journey, your own healing, your own acceptance, your own love is now, you know, revealed itself as the spark in your art that's just ever present. Ah, oh, thank really you. Very, beautiful. very kind of you. It's really you know, you mentioned this term wholeness a couple of times there, and it reminded me of a, a little story, if I may yeah, share it. Yeah. When I first started painting for a long time, as I was doing the oils paintings, I was sign my name Dan B. Holman. And um, and I went to an Easter party and there was this cute little girl that was five years old and she was all dressed in a little Easter dress and stuff. And you know how little little girls can, sometimes they'll flirt with men and stuff, you know, in a sweet little way. And she was doing that. And I went for a walk, uh, for some reason, I went for a walk for about 20 minutes and I came back and the um, hostess of the party said, Mary, that was her name, Mary kept asking, where's Daniel, where's Daniel? And she goes, what was she calling you, Daniel? I said, I don't know. I never will go by Daniel. I always go by Dan. And, the, and she said, well, maybe you should start going by Daniel. And I was so touched by this little girl saying that I started signing my name, my name Daniel B. Holman. And then right after that, someone pointed out to me, oh, it's like your parents were giving you an instruction. Daniel B. Hole, man. Aww. And, I, and I, at that time, I was really getting into this thing of where to be whole is to integrate both the masculine and the feminine. And I was really starting to see and becoming like what I 
call a champion of the feminine as the salvation of the troubles in our world that a lot of the the war and the crime and the violence and the, all these problems that are in the society and it's kind of um you could say a lot of it is you could say it's from the toxic masculine mm -hmm. and the and i look at the to toxic masculine as just a symptom of not having the feminine the healthy feminine integrated so it became one of my um important uh, endeavors and interests to both in myself and to share with other people how important it is to integrate. And I'm talking about not just gender, but the feminine principle, you know, unity consciousness, intuition, the emotional embracing of the emotions, all these types, I mean, on and on, there's so many that is the feminine qualities within us that we need to embrace and exalt into a healthy way. And that will automatically heal and bring the masculine into healthy, appropriate expression. So that became a big part. And that's one of the things that when I got it exposed to the gene keys, Richard Rudd is the master at articulating what I just said, the, articulating the importance of the feminine and how that all works and how it works within us and externally everything. It's just like, it spoke so much to me. I was saying, oh, this guy is stating things that I am realizing and, and upholding to myself, but I could not even think of saying them so beautifully. He's, he's like uh, a, a master at, at, at articulating. So I, I uh, pursued it more and more and the more I pursued the gene key system, the more I recognized its value as a change agent and a transformational tool, which is what I use it as now, not just on myself, which I've kind of done a lot of the work, so to speak. Not that I'm a done at any <laughs> means, but, I, but I've still worked, but I've done a lot of work, but now I use it more as a tool for, um, others to help other people to guide other people because that's important to me is to as a, as a um, someone who enjoys guiding other people that are maybe having a little trouble with their own lives or their own process of, of their own spiritual process to be able to give them some tips and some guidance and it's good to have some good tools to do that and that's what I do I mainly I mean I sometimes I give a little bits of advice or feedback or whatever share my story a little bit or whatever that can sometimes inspire people but the main thing i do is just point them i explain and articulate you know and, and kind of give an orientation to the gene keys and boy i get a lot of praise and feedback positive feedback when they do and they they say wow thank you so much for for turning me on to that valuable tool it changed my life yeah so when did you actually get introduced to the gene keys it, uh, it was in 2011, and then it was also kind of gradual. Um, it was actually 2010, I think. I, I, at the end of 2010, I was someone introduced me to the human design system, and I was kind of somewhat interested in that. I saw some value in it, but it was a little bit mental, a little bit complicated, a little bit yang, <laughs> a little bit too yang, <laughs> if, I, if you will. For my taste and then someone said well, you got to check out this jinkies book so i got the jinkies book and it was like oh my god this is like <laughs> nectar hearing reading these words was just the way it was one well, i was just totally on my frequency it was like my language uh and it just and you just I felt totally incredible resonated. resonance with the uh your diagram <laughs> Did you I have you? And, then, and then i did a lot of the work over time and now I use it mainly as a tool. In fact, just last night, I had a two, about a two hour conversation with this woman in Switzerland who is a Romanian, but she was now living in Switzerland, who was having a little trouble with the gene keys. And she, she, con she found some article that somebody interviewed me a couple of years ago. And she, so she, contact she found my website and contacted me about to get a little help with the gene keys. 
And uh, it was very, it was a beautiful talk. You know, we had a wonderful time and she, uh, she got a lot of clarity on a lot of the confusion she was having about that and got kind of re-inspired about it. And so, so it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm doing my job now. <laughs> That's my job, whether it's through the painting to kind of inspire people or through verbal or written or whatever things with spiritual um, and guidance. Yeah, that's incredible. incredible. I think it's important now more than ever because our world is really going through some massive transformation and changes. And it's very, um, there's a lot going on with climate change and other things that are uh, looking like a lot of aspects of our civilization is falling apart and really uh, troubling for a lot of people because they've been reliant upon that for their stability. And I'm saying, well, no, the stability really is found within the aligning with your own nature and your own connection with divinity within and not on the external systems not on the economic systems or the other social structures we have and all these things that people have kind of relied upon for like i say for stability and, and orientation and it's like uh, as these things are falling apart it's more important than ever to point to people where to find the things that they're really wanting in their lives the safety and security and confidence and prosperity and uh, heartfelt relationships that are stable and healthy all these types of things are found from within not by the grasping at things outside of having more money or better you know doing work on their face you know having face work done or all these other things that people do with their self-image to try to make people like them and thinking that's gonna give them happiness and all these other trying to grasp outside of them to get the things that they really need to find within. And so I'm just kind of pointing them based on my own experience and what I've learned over time of what works, what's effective. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Um, so Daniel, what do you love? What do you love in this now moment? <laughs> what are you loving? I love it when people are having breakthroughs in the in the things that I was like just talking about, when they've been kind of um, disoriented, meaning lost to some degree in whatever ways they're lost and finding their direction, as I sort of described a minute ago their direction, which is found within, their direction to um, a healthy wholeness within themselves and finding out what their true nature is rather than what their conditioning is and facing their shadow and overcoming their obstacles to their um, potential, their highest potential of living as a, as a being in this incarnation. And particularly in these times, which I find are very, uh, volatile and troubling for so many people um, to find themselves and to um, take the steps necessary to face their demons and their shadow and turn that into their gifts by doing that and becoming um, activated participants or contributors to bringing about a better world because I find the world as it is, and I've always have since I was a teenager, the world is pretty fucked up. The world is a mess. It's dysfunctional, it's unhealthy, it's all in the wrong direction with the agriculture and the way we're treating our environment and the way we're treating one another and all these different things. There's so many different arenas. I spent a lot of time looking into those things and uh, it's like, I don't myself, um find that i'm capable of doing much on those levels some people are but i can help people individually and and when groups or whatever to do the inner work that i'm talking about and then those people aligning themselves with them with their true nature and activating more powerfully doing what they're here to do playing their their roles in, in um, contributing 
to the whole rather than being selfish little immature beings. That's what I can do. And that will help bring about a better world by more and more people doing that. Well, it's beautiful, Daniel, because in your expression of your ever expanding wholeness, you're an example of that and you inspire that wholeness and that ever expanding wholeness in others. And so it's really brilliant, isn't it, Daniel? I think you be whole, man. <laughs> I do. Yo. I think I think the little girl, I think she knew. I think she knew. I think that was actually a wink and a smile from God that yeah. that, that that crossed your path because it's just brilliant sitting here having this conversation with you. Yeah. and really tuning into that and your passion and your love for really truly bringing into balance and wholeness the masculine and the feminine within us and our dark and our light and really just being a champion for unity and that you know unified consciousness and yeah. you display that in in assisting people to learn you know being a mentor with the gene keys and and touching many many hearts with your artwork in, the, in that well, same you. way yeah thank you Very so, kind of so you. daniel where can people find you online what's the website they should go look for well they could just put in my name and, and make sure my name is spelled right h-o-l-e-m-a-n um and i'm easily found that way my website is awaken visions which is kind of like a double entendre the idea of of awake in a vision and also awaken as an as a verb to awaken our vision, the possibility in life or whatever our vision is for our lives, which now I've come to see is not something we just imagine. It's something that's encoded in our DNA for us to discover and activate and get rid of all the stuff that's can, you know, kind of occluding it or um, um, uh, diminishing it or not not allowing it to, to thrive and to flourish and to be fully activated. So it's like Awaken Visions, A-W-A-K-E-N-V-I-S-I-O-N-S.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Daniel. I hope everyone is feeling as inspired as I am by today's conversation. And we hope that you will go find Daniel and investigate his artwork and his um, more information about the Gene Keys also and we hope to have you back daniel maybe we can have you back and share a little bit more about the gene key sometime soon that would be wonderful oh, i'd love it it's been a real pleasure you're just a wonderful uh host and i uh, appreciate your uh sharing this time with me and allowing me to share my life with other people because that's I'm, I'm really wanting to um i guess you'd say uh expand my impact it's yes. been so I feel like it's been kind of diminished during this uh, last couple of years with the lockdowns and isolation and all these things. And it's like, OK, well, now's the time really for me to be getting out there, not being all alone in this isolated uh, uh, mode that they put a lot of people in. It was yeah. just changing now, too. It's coming out. But there's other things that are going on that are uh, that it's, you know, it's a good idea for. And I would like to. Mm -hmm get out there more yeah so thank well, you. you are absolutely an inspiring light of love you really thank are you. daniel and it's been an honor to have you here today and i truly look forward to having you back thank you so much and thank, thank you. you everyone for listening i hope you are as inspired as i am today have a beautiful and blessed rest of your day and thanks for being with me on view from love thank you so much namaste